um, when the keep lives kick in or a layer two protocol pulls it down in that case. But, you know, BFD can work out to, certainly to your advantage there. Um, once again, uh, another part of BFD is you have the ability to specify minimum uh, thresholds where you can basically say that what are the minimal thresholds of um, that you want to operate at. And from there, it, the, it's continuously um, negotiating what those timers are going to be um, that the routers can support. So it's not like a static number, and you basically specify you're defining, a, enabling this on a BGP peer group for external peers or whatnot. You can specify the minimal um, thresholds that you want to operate at, and the protocol will negotiate and continually negotiate um, what timers you can safely operate at. And then once the failure is detected, it could then pull that session down. So, um, you know, typically with BGP neighbors, you can already by default specify keep lives and what interval on a per neighbor basis. With this, you could probably do the similar here, but it works out on, you know, exchange land where you have different participants, people have different thresholds of what they can operate on the routers, people have different kind of routing engines and route processors, um, you know, so you can set just a threshold and then it'll negotiate higher uh, as, as configured. Another one, um, where another instance where you can run uh, BFD is in the MPLS space, specific with LDP. You can use this for essentially path verification, um, although you can't really use it to actually reroute or you know, trigger any kind of action in the router because with LDP, you're relying upon your LGP, to, uh, their IGP to tell you where to route. But what it can do is it can at least provide some sort of liveliness detection to say uh, for a particular effect that has gone down and uh, notify you that, at least in, you know, syslog and whatnot. So it does provide you ability to see when um, an LDP-based path is no longer reachable. Um, this is pretty useful um, in, you know, certainly LDP networks, especially if you've ran into issues with LDP black holing. This can typically pick it up on it for you. Um, another capability with LDP is that it allows you to do ECMP. So within your network, you can have a path branch out to multiple paths across the network. And with um, BFD here, it can use a combination of LSPP and Traceroute to discover the entire ECMP tree to the destination. And it could create a BFD session for each individual path and then transmit the packets along. And you can uh, bring up the sessions there. And a quick um, little picture of that is shown here, where in this case, you have two individual BFD sessions. Um, on two diverse um, paths that have equal cost. The next one um, covers MPLS with our, our, our our RSVP, TE, LSPs. In this case, you can use BFD on an individual RSV, RSVP, LSP that's established. And one of the things that you can do here is because, you know, the LSP takes one single path is you can actually enable BFD on a given LSP. And when the LSP fails, you can actually, you know, take some actions at that point. So let's say you have a given uh, destination router, you have an LSP2, you could build multiple paths there and enable BFD in each individual one. And you could say, well, if BFD is running in one LSP across the network, something fails, well, then you can trigger that the standby LSP will take over rather than relying upon um, something else happening in the network, such as getting RSP message back at the head end saying that the path is gone or waiting for CSPF to run and, and take a different path um, in this case. So. Um, it, it really gives you a nice little, if you, you know, have a given destination, you want to verify that you can talk to it, you can use BFT to really trigger and detect if anything's broken along the, on the path. Another capability, um, although I haven't really seen this one deployed, is that you can use our, uh, BFT in the point-to-multi-point -point LSP uh, scenario. Um, and the only reason, you know, perhaps why anyone would want to do this is, you know, point-to-multi-point uh, -point LSPs are typically used for distributing um, video content and things like that across the network. And in those cases, you're already having some sort of additional constraints on you, such as um, rapid re reconvergence, so you've got fast route enabled, bandwidth reservation sometimes, and even explicit routing to stay on SRLG free paths. So in a case where you're probably doing point to multi-point, there's typically a reason for it. You're carrying something that's somewhat important. Um, BFD can be useful here to detect a failure as well. Another case, um, I've seen this deployed, and I'm not sure who actually, if anyone has this implemented, is that you can actually run it in the pseudo wire space. So when you're building either, you know, Ethernet um, layer two VPNs, layer two circuit pseudo wires from a point to different endpoints, you can even use BFD in this space to actually verify that connectivity works end to end. Well, obviously, there's no such thing as a free lunch, and uh, there are some caveats to actually using BFD. And the two main ones, um, at least that I've seen, is that it does, it can have high resource demands on the router, depending on what kind of router you have out there. 
and what timers you're using, as well as um, it doesn't really have any visibility into layer two protocols, specifically um, bundling protocols, so um, Ethernet bundles, things like that. Um, to go on the first one, the resource demands. Um, obviously, you're running BFD, you're running this instance on either a line card or a raw processor. It's firing off pretty frequently. Um, the more sessions you're going to add, the more it's going to, you know, utilize resources on our given router, right? Um, not only that, but each individual vendor, you know, can put their own stipulation when you create a uh, BFD on an interface where they'll put a minimum uh, transmit receive uh, interval where you may have it enabled, you may want to select to use lower timers, but the software has been, you know, essentially instructed to say, no, 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 you're doing it on a bundle interface, your minimal, minimum interval has to be at least 250 milliseconds. So even though you want to run it lower, you may not be able to just because the vendors put some sort of uh, control into it in that case. Um, Another thing is, you know, where, where you're going to run BFD, it runs, you know, it can, you can run a distributed model, but depending on the protocol, it may run off the route processor just because it's not directly associated with any physical adjacency. So if you're running it on IBGP sessions or you're doing it on an LSP, it's got to come from a centralized location on a router, which means it's, it's ending up on the route processor in the end anyway. So, um, you know, the route processor is doing other things, could be doing BGP, could you know, a whole other sort of options, um, you know, that, it's, you know, it's something that you have to be concerned about. And, you know, the main thing here is that you need to test your platform before you do anything here. Whatever you're going to deploy, you definitely want to stress it and, and put some load onto it to see at least if, you know, you're able to break a BFD adjacency um, in, in this case. And, you know, there's lots of ways you could do this, but definitely, you know, want to stress that you should definitely should test, stress test your box. Um, there's a lot of ways you can do this. You can execute a lot of uh, regex commands on, on the route processor itself. You could try to simulate a denial of service attack, such as if you want to see how, what a line card can handle, well, make the line card CPU work a little bit harder. You know, send packets that TTL expire on it, send options, um, do whatever you can, right? Because when you actually end up deploying this, you're going to see a lot of different things in the wild that you just may have not thought would come up. And uh, you definitely don't want BFD to be there pulling things down accidentally uh, in production. Um, Regarding what kind of values are safe to try, um, one popular uh, one that I hear is, you know, 300 milliseconds uh, minimum uh, transmit receive intervals, the multiplier of three, which gets you just barely below a second, so it's technically um, sub-second in that case. And um, from what I've seen of vendor documentation, they seem to recommend that value as well in some of them, but once again, you should probably try some particular value that you're safe with, and then you can work down from there. Um, in any event, it's still better than what the alternatives are, which is relying upon your existing timers or um, even cranking down your existing timers um, where you have to, you know, maintain that across your network. And then if you have different kinds of equipment out there, different route processors, then you have to set different values for different boxes. Um, it, it's still an improvement than what, you know, you may have today. Um, the other caveat that I mentioned was BFD and link bundling. And one of the things here that's kind of a, an issue is that if you do have multiple links in a layer two bundle, um, BFD works at layer three generally when you're building it across, let's say, an IGP adjacency. Um, it doesn't know that there's, you know, four links, ten links, or whatever's really underneath. So when those um, BFD sends out its datagrams, it's typically going to, you know, treat it like it would any other packet that's going across the link, right? So layer two hash, it's going to say, okay, I've got four interfaces you know, this packet's going out on number two, for example. Um, it's not going out through all four, although there's some implementations reportedly that, that can do this, but it's only going to go out through one, and the response is only going to come off through another interface in that case. And, um, well, the problem with that is, well, actually, in that, in that case, what would happen is, let's say it's going out on the interface that just happened to have gone down, well, do you want to declare the entire um, bundle is down at that point just because one individual member link failed? You probably don't want to do that. Um, so it, it can really can bite you in that scenario. Um, a lot of it is dependent on, you know, the BFD implementation on the router. For example, you have a layer two link bundle go down. By the time it sends out the next datagram, it could have already rehashed the layer two bundle and sent it out on a different interface. So, it, you know, it can perhaps work around the inefficiencies of the way that the layer two um, hash bundle, the fact that BFD lacks the ability to look inside of layer two bundle. Um, back on this one, obviously, uh, it is somewhat of a show, uh, showstopper given that, you know, layer two link bundling is pretty popular um, with n by 10 giggy links. Um, you know, uh, 40 gig is there, but, you know, 100 gig is still far along away. 
Um, so, you know, the fact that this doesn't really work all that well in layer two bundles can be a bit of a showstopper. Um, what would be kind of neat would be if you had the capability for BFD to fork on individual member interfaces and operate on every single one and then send it back. But of course, if you were to do that, then you have a different additional uh, BFD sessions to have to worry about, and then that's going to impact your scaling as well. Um, on the conclusion, um, so a few different notes here. Uh, routers do still have faults in the forwarding plane. And, um, you know, where, IG, where you can actually have a fault and, you know, IGP can remain up, but the line cards just do not forward. And I know in 2008 there were at least pretty two large uh, events that did happen where routers just, you know, um, IGP adjacencies remained up, but packets were just not forwarding through the boxes. And, you know, it could take anywhere from minutes or hours in some cases for people to really realize what was going on. Um, you know, the, the default hello and keep alive timers that, you know, some protocols have today, they're still too high. A lot of people don't adjust them. Um, and, you know, it's unfortunate, but a lot of people don't know all the, the knobs and the tweaks or have the time to really experiment and see what works. You know, BFD kind of says it's a little bit of a shortcut to say, well, don't bother playing with them. Just go to this. It's a standardized method. Um, the sessions are, the implementation is pretty much well supported on most vendors today. Just, you know, you don't have to worry about tweaking it. You know, just try this as an option. Um, you know, on the issue of the link to uh, layer two link bundling issues, it'd be great if, you know, there was a way that you can actually get BFD to work in this environment, given that, you know, uh, N by 10 gig is probably going to be with us for still quite some time. N by 40 gig, if you're doing 768 and whatnot, you're still going to have the same problem there, too. Um, the other issue is definitely always remember to stress test your equipment. You know, not one size fits all when it comes to some of these configurations. Regarding, you know, just polling a lot of different operators who do run BFD today. It seems that, you know, of all the ones that I've listed, the only two that really are popular are using it in the eBGP space and using it for IGP adjacencies. But outside of that, I haven't really seen anybody who's actually used it in, you know, the MPLS environment, um, you know, some minimal stuff with uh, OA and M to use it for LDP paths to really notify when black holing or things like that occur. But it seems, you know, the eBGP and uh, IGP adjacencies are probably like, if you're going to play with it, that's probably the first place to start. Um, and it seems to have worked okay in some people's networks today. But, um, you know, there's a lot of people pairing here. There's a lot of people exchanges. It'd be interesting to see if, you know, people said, hey, you know, we went through this whole MD5 thing, and that was a pretty large group effort that a lot of people, you know, went through. Um, it'd be interesting to see if uh, a lot of people would go through kind of a similar support of, hey, let's start enabling BFD in, on the IXs and see how things work out. Um, in, in a widespread manner, at least to find out what vendors it works out well with and uh, what numbers, because there's just not a lot of data out there, to, you know, supporting if people are running this today or, or how well it's been working for them. Um, and that's pretty much about it. I don't know if there's any uh, questions or comments.